my brother died on a Wednesday, three weeks ago. It split what was supposed to be a very typical week for our family in half. Without going into any of the morbid details, let's say Monday and Tuesday represented a thick chunk of wood. Wednesday then throws a chainsaw into the mix, and I'm sure you can imagine the state of Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. May as well add up every single day up until this point, if anyone's still counting. The wounds still haven't healed. In fact, they are still as fresh as the day they first opened. My mum chose to undergo therapy and grief counselling. My dad started drinking again, and I cried every day for what felt like weeks, but mostly in private. I was offered counselling myself, but I declined because I didn't really want to talk about it. About him. I actually have a lot to say about Aid, which was his name by the way. But why should I force myself to open up about someone who didn't even know him personally? Someone who probably has a predetermined list of subject matter to discuss with someone like me. And I bet I can tell you what the checklist says. 17 year old, check. Male, check. Dead sibling, check. Ask him about his relationship with his brother. Talk about the importance of friendship at a time like this. Okay, but I don't have friends because Aid was my only real friend. Ever since we watched Son of Rambo together, he loved to call us blood brothers. Except we were real blood brothers, genetically bound by the very liquid that courses through our veins. The same veins that he sliced open with a kitchen knife that my mum got in a set as a Christmas present. Ironic, isn't it? Christmas was actually when Aid first started acting distant. It became obvious, because like most kids our age, Christmas was his favourite holiday. Now don't get me wrong, I could have told you when Aid was on the verge of tears because I had taken the last lemon flavoured ice bomb, even if he profusely refused to admit it. But given the time of year, it was so much more obvious. Brotherly instincts work in mysterious ways, and so when Christmas Eve rolled around, an aide wasn't running into my room like an ape who'd just been released from Chicago Zoo, screaming, One more sleep, one more sleep. I was naturally very eager to find out why. I talked to Aid that morning in his room, knocking on his door, and hearing his tired little voice only made me even more concerned. However, I have always felt a subconscious duty to refrain from being that type of older sibling. The type of older sibling that constantly reminds the younger half that they have childish, ritualistic obligations that they must follow until the older sibling finally decides they no longer have to. So when Aid jarringly looked up at me from his desk with pen in hand and his old scrapbook in front of him, his mousy brown curls ferociously looping just above his wide, chummy, chestnut-coloured eyes and said that he was fine. I simply believed him. I appreciate that I missed the initial signs that morning. As you can probably imagine, it's something that I will never forgive myself for. Aid turned 13 last year. I assumed that he had just outgrown the magic of Christmas and that it no longer excited him like it used to. Sure, it was kind of abrupt, but I had no reason to bother him about it. Aid's mood continued throughout the day, and so Christmas Eve proved mostly ordinary and quiet. We watched Home Alone before we ate, which didn't particularly pique my interest, because I've seen it more times than I have sneezed. I only really watched it to monitor Aid, and to his credit, he smiled a few times. Home Alone was never really one of his favourites, so at the time, this was more than enough to satisfy me. By the time we ate, I started to feel uneasy about Aid's mood again. Dad was nursing his own mood, because his annual Christmas Eve booze up with his co-workers had been called off. But to her credit, Mum had gone out of her way to prepare what had been his favourite meal, chicken tenders. I'm talking about the ones from Whole Food that they tell you to soak in buttermilk on the back of the packaging. 
Not only could Ave devour 17 of these things in under a minute, he usually helped Mum by jumping into the back kitchen counter and individually dipping all of the tenders to such a precise degree that they all looked like they had been prepared in a factory. There was no such thing this time around though, and I finally snapped and asked what was up when Aid began fingering his food rather than eating it. It was just too unlike him, and it became clear his mood was rooted deeper than I initially thought. His reply? Honestly, I'm just fine. I'm not that hungry. The F word again. The most manipulated word in the English language. Just say it, and it magically cures all your problems, fears, and uncertainties, or at least makes everyone in the room believe that it has. When Aid only managed a few uninspired laughs, and didn't stand up in the middle of the room to sing a singles verse from A Nightmare Before Christmas, everyone was naturally very eager to know why. It wasn't that it was his civic duty to perform for us. All we wanted to know was what was bothering him. He refused to tell us that anything was wrong. The majority of the time, I tried to ask him after that. He would just pretend he was drawing or writing in his old scrapbook, until I left him alone. We never really found out what was wrong with my brother. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the first episode in this series. Be sure to tune in in two weeks time for the next one. It's going to be epic. Of course, a huge thank you to Creepy Mations for animating this. A truly outstanding job. He actually has even more animations on his channel. So be sure to check him out. The link on screen now and in the description. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.